Hello. So I am back and uh, I would like to go on with the presentation of today. First of all, actually I would like to uh, thank another cooperation that we have here in these days, especially because now we are going to speak about ubiqu ubiquitous identities. And uh, uh, we have been already for the second time with us the Chelsea Manning Initiative from Berlin. And I think it's pretty related to the discourse of ubiquitous identities also because uh, um, we are marking uh, with their presence the five years of incarceration of Chelsea Manning. And also I would like to tell you that uh, after the break, uh, uh, after this panel, we will have another break, and uh, you could go on the stand uh, over there, and it's also possible to write postcards uh, uh, to Chelsea Manning uh, that she can receive that uh, while in prison. So uh, at the same time, there is also information about her, and uh, I really would uh, be happy in advising you to do that and also contribute to, to the cause. And. Uh, now, as I say, uh, the panel is entitled Ubiquitous Identities with Massimo Canevacci, and the panel is moderated by Francesco Warber Macarone Palmieri. So I will introduce uh, Francesco, and then he will introduce Massimo. And I'm really happy to say that uh, this with Francesco is actually a long-term uh, collaboration that we had, because we were already working together in the past for many events here in Berlin, but also especially at the Transmediale Festival, uh, because we deem, uh, we, had, uh, we took a bit the challenge also to bring inside the festival the discourse of pornography, sexuality, connected to a critical understanding of technology. And it's actually something that I hope the Transmediale Festival will still do in the future. And, uh, Speaking about uh, ubiquitous identities, also I can say that Francesco is an ubiquitous identity <laughs> because uh, he's somebody that is doing really many things. He's a social anthropologist, a performance artist, a curator, and also a DJ. And uh, his work is based on cultural studies with the focus of uh, new media, net porn study, and also the epistemology of emotions. At the moment, he's doing uh, a PhD at the Department of Civil and en Environmental Engineering of La Sapienza University of Rome. And he just published a book uh, in Italian that is about Berlin, and especially it's called Tanz Berlin, Oltre il Muro del Clubbing, that is also about the clubbing scene of the city. Uh, that is also why he's the co-producer and resident DJ of the Berlin-based by monthly queer events gagging at the Kit Kat Club. And actually, just to promote a bit, <laughs> because uh, after our events uh, conference of tomorrow, he will actually play at the Schwutz in Neukölln, so you are all invited also to come there and have a party with us. And now uh, I call here Francesco. Thanks uh, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. This works, okay. I um, want to start uh, to uh, thank the Disruption Network uh, Lab to uh, open this kind of um, discussion about, uh, in a way, hidden uh, thinker who thought before the time. And I think that this is uh, the real theme here in relationship to the cyborg applied to uh, epistemology and method. The possibility, thank you, <laughs> to, <laughs> to let time and spaces explode and uh, to, uh, to be a psychical nomad. So to cross moment and through this crossing producing uh, a critical vision. And to me, uh, this is uh, the biggest uh, heritage uh, of Caronia's work, especially in, uh, inside the cyborg, because in the cyborg, he was able to apply a cybernetic methodology to a, a sociology of imaginary. So he was able to define the imaginary of the present from the future. So he was able to analyze the causes from the effects through uh, basically science fiction and cyberpunk. 
through cyber, cyberpunk and, cyber, and uh, science fiction, he was able to define the concept of a cyborg through um, a multi-sided approach, through a, a multidisciplinary, very pr prismatic vision. And uh, I wanted to apply this kind of methodology even to analyze what kind of uh, cultural context uh, produced the idea of him as a cyborg before him. And I, was, I wanted to speak about a very strange object, object that was a magazine in Italy at the end of the 70s, and it was called Frigidaire. And uh, Frigidaire was done by uh, Vincenzo Sparagna, and uh, there was a very strange object because it gathered a lot of like freaks, sexual deviants, junkies, anarchists, and writers and uh, thinkers, and gave it a form to that, and he was able to put it inside the mainstream media. Because this magazine, although it was like almost at, at the limit of uh, acceptable contents for the time, it was distributed in a mainstream way. It was like in kiosk, in bookstore, you can find it everywhere. And that was like a, a very interesting uh, non-resolved contradiction about like position of the time and the, the approach to media. But what is more interesting to me is that the people that was working and dealing uh, uh, with each other in that collective, in that editorial project, uh, defined not just the cyborg, but a cyberpunk idea of the cyborg at the end of the 70s, before um, Caronia conceptualized the cyborg as a, 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 a post-human and post-modern imaginary and as a methodology. And I wanted to show you, for example, a cover. You can wait a moment. Two authors inside this magazine, uh, they, um, they uh, developed a, the, a comic that was called Rank Xerox. Rank Xerox uh, was a very interesting uh, global construction of a cyborg, so global and local construction of the cyborg, because basically he was uh, uh, a, a synthetic Roman tag. Oh, here we are. So this is one of the covers of the magazine uh, Frigidaire, to let you understand what kind of things were happening in terms of cultural production in Italy at the end of the 70s. And this is Rank Xerox. So uh, the story of Rank Xerox, Rank Xerox is very uh, um, interesting and eccentric because basically he was a cyborg that was built up by a, a group of dissidents that squatted the, the Roman University. And they needed like somebody who went out to buy food, cigarettes, drugs, and come back. So they built it with a the technology they had at disposition, that were the photocopy machines. And that was like super cyberpunk, but not just that. It was even that uh, the, the, this group of dissidents was shot down, was killed, and he started his own life in a city that was Rome, that was uh, thought in 77 to be in 85. So you see this kind of sliding, you know, from uh, the effect to the causes that tells the now. And the story, the, the story goes on, this is on the cover, you know, Frigidaire and Xerox. He was moving inside this Rome that was thought uh, in more than 30 levels, and every level was a world where like groups of gangs, punks, freaks were gathering together even in a violent way. And he, uh, this is, yeah, this is another uh, part of a comic. And he was an emotional cyborg. He had a very strong love story with an 11th year old uh, heroin junkie whose name was Lubna. And uh, the story goes on, they were living together, you know, and uh, after this uh, 30th level of Rome, this is her like building him up. And the Lubna was part of a g gang of riot girls that were like messing around uh, in the <coughs> dangerous levels of Rome, and they were modeling for a magazine that is called Hooligans Vogue. So, uh, <laughs> and that was happening in the 77. And uh, Tamburini and Liberatore, the, the, the writer and the comic drawer, they stopped doing this because in 1985, 
Tamburini died of an heroin overdose. And this is exactly the same here when uh, Caronia published the first version of the cyborg. So there is this very, very strange connection. And uh, what is interesting for me about the, the cyborg in a cyberpunk way in relationship to epistemology and methodology is the fact that Caronia himself says that uh, science fiction and cyberpunk have some kind of a, an ontological dominance. So this means that modernist literature in terms of language question the world by saying what we can know about the world. Um, how is the world studied and read and how is uh, communicated, teached and shared. While science fiction and cyberpunk uh, have this ontological perspective, they say what is a world? What elements constitute a world? Are there other worlds? Is there, is there a multiplicity of worlds? And if there is a multiplicity of worlds, what happens if we pass through worlds? So what is the concept of reality in a, a multi-sided, multidisciplinary approach? And I think that this is basically uh, the biggest uh, epistemological and then methodological heritage that Caronia with the cyborg left us in the present from the future. And here we have Massimo Canevacci. Massimo Canevacci is a, a cultural anthropologist and I had the pleasure to study with him uh, at the Department of Sociology inside the La Sapienza University. Then we started to work together in the same time and uh, he introduced me to a lot of different anthropologists and uh, ethnographies. He introduced me to uh, urban anthropology, to uh, youth cultural studies and countercultural studies, but most of all, he introduced me to uh, a criticism of the epistemology as the power relationship between the researcher and the study object. And that was the, the biggest heritage that I took from him, basically. Uh, now he's teaching, uh, he's a visiting professor at uh, Sao Paulo University. He teaches all over Brazil, which he loves, basically. And uh, his most important work, which is uh, it's really a, an open methodological uh, text in relationship to the beauty of the city, which is Sao Paulo, is entitled uh, A Ciudade Polifonica, Ensayo sobre Antropologia de Comunicação Urbana. And uh, this is uh, one of the books that touched me more in this kind of open approach on passing uh, through different worlds and even being able to abandon him or herself to the city as a polyphonic text. So in a way, he introduced and um, produced a lot of uh, questioning rising way before uh, the critical anthropology reigned back uh, in all different academias. And he raised this kind of crisis as a tool of interpretation, not just as a, de as a denunciation, because it would have been too easy. But what is uh, punk in cyber is taking the crisis and using it uh, as a model of interpretation and research. And this is what he has always done, and this is what I think uh, is about uh, ubiquitous identities. So I uh, leave him the microphone uh, and ask him uh, how would Rank Xerox make anthropology today? Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, I would like to stress that uh, a professor has to learn by his student, and Francesco was uh, my professor also when I was working on youth culture. Uh, but my first, uh, Antonio Caronia was my friend, a friend of mine, so I would like to my first thought to Antonio, and I would like to thank uh, Tatiana and all your organization. I would like to um, introduce my conference with uh, 
uh, Georgi Ligeti poem, a symphonic, a symphonic poem, but it's not possible. So I would like to suggest you, please take note of this kind of uh, masterpiece, of music, uh, contemporary music masterpiece, because it's very important uh, if uh, you want to work not only w through um, uh, discourse uh, or to imagine, uh, but also with music, uh, and Ligeti was a very special one. Well, uh, I've tried to introduce my cyborg anthropology, and uh, because my perspective is the following, how is it possible to think, rethink, reenact the cyborg perspective in contemporary times? This is my question, and my answers are the following. First of all, uh, digital culture, digital ethnography, and then ubiquitous identities, and uh, meta fetishism that will be the, the focus of my conference. And in the same time, I would like to connect uh, the cyber perspective with my ethnographic research on Bororo culture in Mato Grosso, in Brazil, because this kind of uh, tension between what it seems to be very ancient, but it's contemporary, and what is very emergent, uh, but in the same time, it's also very, very uh, ancient, is very, very important for me. <coughs> My second image is the following. Here on the left, you can find uh, the skull. There is not a skull of um, a Bororo woman whose skull was transformed in uh, ancestral being through a very complex uh, ritual, the funeral Bororo. And on the right, uh, you can see the another kind of being in uh, Odyssey, uh, in the space Odyssey, how it is in English, space Odyssey. And uh, this is, for me, one of my questions. Why the cyborg have been always a concentration of uh, uh, public vices and without public virtues? How it was possible that uh, a cyborg is such kind of a concentration, just like a hull, hole, in the uh, space uh, Odyssey, and how it is possible to change this kind of perspective? Um, for me, it's just metafetishism, but I will talk about after with this one. Um, Ubiquitous uh, identity is connected with a wandering ethnography. You know, ethnography is not possible that it will be in a static uh, place to work, to research, to reflect. But uh, the, the perspective of wandering, and also through digital critical theory, but also doing ethnographic work is so important and so emotionally involving that for me, ethnography is not uh, the traditional anthropological method, uh, but uh, if you want to make a research uh, on cyber or whatever you want, uh, you have to use in your own way the ethnographic uh, methodologies. I will try to speak about the f five uh, questions, ubiquity, methods in montage, identity, metafetishism, uh, perhaps, exact uh, imagination, but I, uh, t this morning I was remembering that uh, for me Ovidio uh, is always uh, still now important, not only poet, uh, philosopher, anthropologist, because uh, his book on metamorphosis uh, began just in Nova Fert Animus Mutatas Dicere Forma Corpora. So this kind of uh, desire or transformation in your own body is just in the one of most important concept that the Western culture, the Greece philosopher had invented, metamorphosis. And I think that there is a great connection between metamorphosis, metafetishism, and cyborg. Ubiquitous identities. I will try to uh, face three concepts, the simultaneity, chronotope, and ubiquity. Simultaneity. First of all, 
just at the beginning of the last century, the futurist movement, the avant-garde of futurists, so complex with different kinds of politics and also artistic uh, uh, perspective, have uh, one point, uh, one common point, simultaneity. Simultaneity was so important for futurists because they look at uh, the new kind of metropolis in Milano, first of all in Milano, uh, they understood that uh, different uh, form of communication in the street, in the studio, in the theater, and so on, was simultaneously uh, re-elaborated in a work of art. In painting, here is Boccioni. Boccioni was uh, as a sculpture that how it is possible to elaborate a simultaneous movement of a body through statue. And uh, this is uh, the way that uh, Boccioni, forme uniche della continuità del, nello spazio, first uh, of the First World War, you know, he tried to, 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 to represent. And, uh, and simultaneous was also a kind of echo. This is in architecture. Sant'Elia was another special architect. Uh, he died in the First World War, that just one century ago. And he is a very special kind of imagination of uh, uh, design, a new kind of metropolis. That's why I would like to stress the relationship between simultaneously, simultaneously and metropolis is the context, uh, philosophical, empirical, and methodological context for uh, elaborate a new kind of avant-garde in Milan, futurism. The second one is the concept of chronotope. Mikhail Bakhtin was a, a very special critical, uh, critical literature in, uh, in United Soviet. It was a very marginal um, researcher. And uh, he tried to elaborate a new kind of concept about chronotope. And this kind of relationship between space-time uh, was uh, focused on the way the most important uh, uh, literature writing was expressed. And he uh, elaborated this kind of dialogical imagination between different identities in uh, Dostoevsky. Uh, in his uh, point of view, Dostoevsky was the first uh, literature author that was not projecting himself to the character. So th the, the tension between the author and the hero were resolved by Dostoevsky in uh, multiplying uh, uh, psychologies, uh, the way of writing, of thinking, of emotional, of every, every uh, character. Th so uh, the concept of uh, chronotop uh, was very connected to a concept that for me is very, very important, of a polyphony and dialogical. So you can understand this is very important for anthropology because at that time, anthropologists uh, were writing uh, his, her own book, their own book, only from their point of view. There was only the anthropologist's point of view expressed in their book. And in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s also, uh, there was a great revolution in uh, cultural anthropology because uh, with this kind of polyphony, uh, we can uh, look for a decentralizing method of representation. There is not only the anthropological point of view, but also the so-called native, informant, local persons. That's why this kind of relationship between polyphony, dialogical, and, uh, 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 and uh, space-time connection in Bakhtin was so important for social sciences. And also, uh, you can see uh, Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead, that uh, were, they were very, very, very special for me, very special, not only an anthropologist, but also the great researcher, as we can see later. Theological ubiquity, first of all, was uh, connected to a theology. You know, you can hide yourself, your body, everywhere, but uh, God, Christian God, have, can look at you. You cannot go away, not the control, 
the ubiquitous control that Christian God can find you everywhere and he can judge you everywhere. So this is the complexity of the ubiquity concept. First of all, you can stay everywhere, but the matrix is a very theological matrix. But uh, digital ubiquity is quite different. I, I, I select here a manifestation in Madrid, uh, a manifestation that is not a real manifestation, but it also real manifestation is a 3D manifestation that the organizer, uh, Podemos, that everybody knows Podemos, no? uh, is uh, um, uh, moving against uh, a lay of uh, the Spanish uh, government. So this kind of uh, uh, potential imagination uh, is uh, connected to the rising of uh, uh, techno digital, uh, digital technology and is quite different. It's not the same concept of ubiquity. Uh, also because uh, no concept is uh, uh, stopped in its own movement. Uh, I think that the, uh, our way of thinking is, is very special when we are able to transform uh, the relationship between concept and meaning. So the meaning of ubiquity or contemporary meaning of ubiquity is quite different from the theological one. And uh, I've, in my opinion, the ubiquitous subject is the uh, ethnographic, uh, has the ethnographic experience. And for me, I like to express this kind of uh, subjectivity as multividual. Um, the, the concept of identity, you know, is changing in our culture, especially in Western culture, but in other cultures, very complicated. But also everywhere, the question of identity is central. So you have to try to understand how it uh, changes this kind of uh, uh, ubiquity and how ubiquitous, uh, ub ubiquity time, this time of uh, connection between space and time is just clarifying where we're going to work today. Um, because uh, our everyday experience uh, is going to be favoring between this kind of nonlinear paths you know, or space time. And this is another, for me, important concept that, that I would like to discuss with you that is syncretism. Syncretism, not in a religious, uh, just like ubiquitous uh, perspective, but syncretism, just like uh, a dissonant mix of different cultures and different identities. So, this kind of uh, uh, syncretism connected to digital uh, culture uh, and, uh, uh, and multividual identity is just inside this kind of uh, ubiquity time. Oh, Waldo and Black Mirror. Black Mirror is a very special example of uh, British serial. For me, it's just the only serial that has the capacity to focus how it's going to change the system, not only of narrative or narration, but also of uh, images, of plot, how to connect the digital experience uh, to a serial, a TV serial. And also, the concept of black mirror for me is very important because it's a black mirror you have to break in order to penetrate this kind of uh, uh, ubiquity. It is also very interesting that the, for me, the first author that uh, focused uh, the concept of ubiquity was Adorno. Adorno was in exile, exile in the 40 in the United States. He was making research on broadcasting, on radio, and uh, so ubiquity is unique to the medium and distinguish radio to the other forms of communication. He already understood that ubiquity, contemporary ubiquity, not the theological one, but political one, was connected to a new kind of mass media that is going to, to change uh, our culture. And another concept 
Adorno concept for me very, very special is physiognomy, phy physiognomy. Radio, only this, the kind of speaking through radio has a physiognomy. And this kind of physiognomy for me, we have to focus how it's going to change in the, uh, digital culture. And uh, uh, for me, it's also a, a paradox uh, because, you know, Adorno was very uh, a critical point of view against uh, mass media. And in the same time, his concept of ubiquity was uh, reenacted by a, an important uh, researcher, contemporary researcher, that is uh, uh, Weiser, no, Mark Weiser. And, uh, he was the inventor, for me, I don't know if it's, uh, it's uh, 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 of ubiquitous computing in 1988. And I loved four kinds of concepts elaborated by Mark Weiser. The first one, that the best computer is quiet. It's just like an invisible servant. And the second is uh, that intuition may be smarter through the use of digital culture. This is very important because the relationship between spontaneous intuition and uh, uh, informatic uh, methodology is the question. Not only mathematics, but not only intuition. We have to cross this kind of, uh, of apparently different uh, methodology. The third one is very complex and for me is very perturbing, very uncanny. The computer should extend your unconscious. How is going to change our or mine unconscious? Which kind of relationship there is between my body, my eyes and the screen? Now, and how the screen is going to penetrate inside my body, my body soul? This is the problem. And so I think it's very complex to use the same concept of unconscious of the one century ago. We have to explore how unconscious is penetrating through the screen to digital culture to our identity. And so the last one, technology should create calm. This is very special. I, I hope that it's going to produce calm, but I, I, I do not say everybody is <laughs> agree with uh, uh, Mark Weiser, but I think uh, there is a possibility. I think we have to organize our way of life in order to reflexive uh, our unconscious, more or less, but also to try to produce a calm way of look at. Here, what happened? Okay. I hear is about uh, methodology and montage. There is, uh, unfortunately, it's not possible to look. And now there are many authors that I loved that I was using the concept of montage for different kind of uh, elaboration. First one is Thomas Mann. Thomas Mann, in a letter to Adorno about uh, Dr. Faustus, wrote, what I want particularly to account, commenting myself, is the method is the method is the montage running through no singular and perhaps impacting the whole book so it's very important that uh, also montage is a literal form of creativity and this is Thomas Mann and this is Adorno the second one is Gregory Bateson um, in the post uh, um, uh, post fiction, I can say post uh, uh, book of uh, Nave, and a very important uh, ethnographic book. He wrote, "Explanation is about the fitting together the data. How to fix together the data is the method, and this kind of method is not in the field work. It's at home. When you go back at home, and you are trying to fix together the data." Here, a very complex uh, ritual in a Yatmul culture uh, where there is a kind of uh, seduction of the mother uncle for his nephew. Very sexual uh, seduction. 
The third one is obviously Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin, in a very, very simple uh, note in his most famous book, is writing, this works method, literary montage, simple, hard, great. Uh, the montage is the, all the Walter Benjamin uh, method is based on montage. He was very influenced by cinema and so on, but also in the way of uh, researching and of writing. The writing, the philosophical writing of Benjamin is based on montage. And uh, the last one is Zahadid. She is an uh, anglo iraqi architect, and uh, she said, I always think about how we can put the object together. How to put object together, data together, quotation together, personage, character together. This kind of complex montage is going to cross literary, philosophy, and also in architecture, contemporary architecture, just like uh, Zaha did. Uh, but uh, I have to go back another montage because uh, Gregory Bateson is, has uh, had a very special uh, relationship with uh, uh, cybernetic because he was making research in New Guinea, in Naven, and he elaborated this kind of concept, schismogenesis, the way in the same group different persons are going to have a, a schism, a, 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 a division. And this kind of uh, behavior was very, very important for Norbert Wiener. Norbert Wiener, um, when he was going to organize his research group on cybernetic, he wanted Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead together with him, especially Gregory Bateson. Because there was a relationship a very strange, complex relationship between schismogenesis, elaborated in a very long uh, uh, yatmul ritual, and feedback. This kind of connection the, between schismogenesis and feedback is, was fundamental in order to elaborate the cybernetic. So, cybernetic is, was the, uh, was possible to be elaborated because there was a transdisciplinary connection between an informatic and an anthropologist. That's the way uh, a cyber anthropology have to reenact uh, today for me. And um, there was a very critical point of view of Wiener, Bateson, and Margaret Mead about traditional engineering and there, no? the informatic have to stay inside and outside the box. Inside and outside is crossing the border. No, you cannot stay outside just like a traditional engineering. And this uh, was elaborated by another great uh, important uh, uh, thinker, no? von Foster. What is needed now is a description of the descriptor. This is anthropology. This is ethnography. We are inside the research. We are not inside, outside. We are jumping, we are crossing inside the screen and outside the screen. So, in other words, we need a theory of the observer. Not a theory of the observed. A theory of the observer. It means a, a theory of every one of us here. Zadid. Zadid elaborated many important uh, concepts, hybridized, morphine, deform, iterate, but uh, here I would like to focus only with one, just one. Symptoms of a, a repressed impurity. Her architecture, her architectural form, design, is based on this concept of symptom. You know, um, the impurity, the concept of impurity in our culture, Western culture, was just the principal enemy of our identity, 
our identity should be, have to be, pure, authentical, and originary. Pure, authentical, and originary. But this is, doesn't work. This, it doesn't work. And so, this kind of try to hide the impurity uh, from the added point of view, produce and symptoms. We have to look at this kind of symptoms based of uh, repressed impurity and transform them in work of art. Her work of art is just this kind of repressed symptoms that began to be architecture. Experience, erlebnis. So this kind of uh, contemporary cyborg, uh, in, also in the Zahadid world, is post-Euclidean physiognomy. Post-Euclidean, we are in, in this kind of place that is totally Euclidean for geometrical form. But in the same time, you know, there are a lot of architecture, and not only architecture, they are uh, trying to design a post-Euclidean uh, uh, architecture, but also a post-Euclidean way of thinking, of expressive, of uh, uh, elaborate our emotion. This is our, our problem. And uh, this is, a, I, I was quoting uh, a, a, an assistant of her. I think the design method can be considered the precursor of, of to computing. He, she was working in the in the 80 when there was not the use the, the normal use of a of computer but she was just elaborating a kind of uh, of methodology that was anticipating the logical of computing and here we are in the ubiquitous identity the egos is the montage uh, in not the ego, but the individual has uh, multiple, uh, in Portuguese, uh, eus, in Italian, uh, i, plural of io, in German, ich, I don't know how to be the, the plural of ich, ichs, okay, x, x, not x, x, yeah, perhaps. <laughs> and uh, um, here I would like to stress that uh, U ubiquitous identity is material and immaterial. Uh, this is my point of view. Um, we are the possibility to experiment uh, a kind of uh, post-dualistic uh, methodology. Ubiquity, the concept of ubiquity is this kind of uh, capacity. Ubiquity is uh, is space time, is material immaterial, is fantasy and technology. And so I think that uh, perhaps our most important political and uh, also individual problem is how to go beyond the dichotomic uh, way of thinking, the dichotomic way of make uh, politics, of make uh, uh, our uh, everyday experience. Once uh, identity was related to a productive industrial system, no? reproductive familiar, monosexual system, poorest ethnic system, biologist uh, generational system, territorial, and so on. This is the, 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 the industrial wave of uh, uh, work, territory, family, ethnicity, gender, class, uh, are cultural traits beyond the industrial sociological pattern in this ubiquitous uh, identity perspective. That's why ubiquitous identity play a fluid displacement, uh, uncanny styles, and ambiguous psychology. Very ambiguous psychology we have to face. So these uh, are contemporary artists, not that going to, to cross the distinction from roots to roots, from roots where identity has to be fixed on the territory, to roots where you're going uh, wandering uh, ethnographic and also diasporic uh, e experience. Um, so this is, uh, for me, 
Um, I, I don't know, I discovered it recently, this kind of author, Gerald Raunig. He was quoting um, a theologist of the uh, uh, 12th century, 12th century, no, Gilbert de la Porre, who is working about dividum, the concept of dividum has a possibility to multiply his or her new kind of identities. Uh, so after Ovidio, this uh, Gilbert, that is working in a very complex system, a political system, he was always in the, in, in the state, status of uh, uh, heterodoxy, uh, and just like Ovidio, but uh, his concept of dividum, um, I would like to suggest that you to try to reenact in digital culture. This multividual, uh, I mean that individual is the Latin translation of uh, atomon, but we can uh, look at a different kind of interpretation of meaning, just like individuality, polyphonic and diasporic identity. Um, another author that I would like to offer to you is just uh, Pessoa. Now, Fernando Pessoa invented the concept of uh, heteronomia, heteronomy. And uh, in a way, for me, more advanced than Dostoevsky, <laughs> and also of Bakhtin uh, uh, kind of, uh, of, um, of critics. Because he uh, <coughs> experimented a very a polyphony of Eus, Eus, ich, polyphony. Uh, he invented different kind of uh, uh, himself, of uh, his egos, uh, writing different kind of literature with different kind of, uh, of styles and psychology. And so the concept of heteronomy, for me, is the concept mice, uh, more, describe more, uh, mice in Portuguese, uh, uh, nearer to, to uh, ubiquitous identity. Later on. Uh, and The fourth point of view is meta-fetishism. Meta-fetishism for me is beyond an anthropocentric anthropology. This is my point of view. How to experiment a new kind of anthropology that is beyond the anthropocentric point of view. And here I was very impressed to, to read, uh, not the last, but I think the, 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 the first and uh, only one Cronenberg book that consumed. I will try to, uh, to, to quote some kind of uh, send this image to me through the internet out into the universe where I will continue my out of body existence. I think that this kind of reflection, of uh, Cronenberg reflection, I would like to remember you that uh, um, Cronenberg, uh, well, with in 1984, he filmed the, mov the most, for me, important uh, film about this kind of question, Videodrome. Now, Videodrome, for me, is a masterpiece now, about the, the uh, together, just uh, uh, Neuromante, both uh, no, Gibson and uh, Cronenberg are from uh, Toronto. So, in Toronto, there was, a, and there is still, a very special school about uh, mass media. So. Uh, in 1984, both they invented the, the cyberpunk and at the same time, with the Videodrome, this kind of uh, out-of-body exist existence. And uh, this is a connection with the digital culture. Um, I read this. A cyber ecology of mine, um, I try to elaborate a, a post-dualistic uh, perspective about body and corpse, subject and object, skin and screen, and so on. And metafetishism is just, but metafetishism, uh, I would like to, this is another 
consumed the quotation. She pulled the phone back to look to her photo, then drawn by his ruthless intensity, kissed the images. Her lips left semen, swirls on the screen. Commodity fetishism at its finest. Commodity fetishism, for me, is one of the center of ethnographic research because there is a very proliferation of new kind of fetishism through digital culture. So just like I'm conscious may not be the same of uh, uh, one century ago, also fetishism is going to change. How is going to change fetishism? I think that Cronenberg is just like Freud, uh, contemporary Freudian uh, researcher. But not with this movie on that I didn't like. Um, how to elaborate an ecology or mindful body of things? This is my perspective. How we can imagine a different expi expansions of body along things, object, commodity, or facticity. Um, uh, this is a kind of um, Brazilian, Sao Paulo, uh, 3D architecture. It's very important. It's a lot, lot of work with the cyber culture. And I think. So. Well, um, obviously there is no time for to speak about this, but my perspective is how to elaborate the colonial uh, matrix, how Marx uh, continued, Freud and so on, but there is no time for it. Uh, I would like to only to add, this is the connection between the Videodrome and Black Mirror, but I would like to living physiognomy, I would like to, in five minutes, uh, uh, this is a, is a joke, but not exactly, exact imagination is a very important concept for me. And uh, exact imagination is just the relationship between a very important uh, scientific uh, Jesuit, uh, um, Pacioli, in, in, uh, during the Renaissance, but uh, my question is, why the painter, uh, Jacopo de Barberi, put together uh, uh, this Jesuit, the, uh, scien the, the scientist, uh, with, together with a beautiful Fiorentine uh, uh, man, which is the connection between science and beauty. I think there's a, a very special connection. We are try, you have to try to continue to elaborate connections between what is the beauty and what is the science. Uh, uh, not separate them. That's why uh, I put my follow here because uh, this is a, a reflexive perspective. It's not just because I am I, I, I here. But it's very important that the ethnographer is inside and outside the scene, the box, the context. It's jumping that you are having to work. And so it's very important how to how I can reflex about uh, myself. But uh, the, very, the very final thing is just like, because for me, just like, well, more or less, Gregory Bateson about uh, um, schismogenesis, feedback, and so on, for me, uh, not was, but is very, very important in, uh, in a, a multi sided perspective, the funeral the Baroro funeral in Mato Grosso, this kind of metamorphosis or transformation of uh, a dead skull in an ancestral being. So the skull is never dead. So the relationship, the Baroro relationship, Baroro, Baroro are living in uh, Mato Grosso, in Meruri, the same Aldeia village where Levi Strauss uh, uh, elaborated uh, his uh, very famous uh, Trist uh, Tropique. Um, uh, how is possible that uh, a skull is not a skull? Is at the same time a living being that is connecting not only the people all around him, her in this case because she is, she was a woman, she is a woman, but also all the Bororo dead of all time. So ubiquity 
is also an experience, an ubiquity identity is also an experience of Bororo culture, Bororo uh, ritual. So this is for me, not this identical, uh, it's a connection, it's a tension, it's a multi-perspective that we have to cross what is apparently very long for our experience and what is today. I'm going to finish. This is cosmology, it's a little bit going to change, but uh, uh, Bororo identity uh, uh, is not going to change through uh, Salesian uh, transformation, urban transformation. And um, my uh, final is just, ah, please. Francesco, may you do not? Uh, there is a connection for me between uh, ubiquity and utopia. And for me, it's a, 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 very, a very strange connection. It was elaborated more or less some months ago because... Uh, where is... I don't find it. Okay, it's not possible. Ubiquity is every place. And utopia is in no place. So for me, ubiquity identity is just crossing utopia and ubiquity. Because it's in the same time and the same space, in no place and everywhere. This is the kind of, uh, of uncanny research we are going to live every day through our new cyber imagination that for me have to be a different kind of not anthropocentric cyborg. This is our challenge for me. Thank you. Now we're going to do um, a little bit of dialogue and uh, a Q&A about uh, ubiquitous identities, okay? And uh, we're going to open the discussion. But before opening the discussion, uh, well, it was like a, a very um, uh, dense open text, the one that you uh, presented. And uh, it gave a lot of uh, elements to think about that were not synthesized. Even the elements were dialogical between each other. It's like they were speaking between each other. And not, it was not synthesized in a way. And it was a circular from a presentation. But I wanted to ask you th something. Uh, one thing uh, that I liked uh, it was the fact that you, you weren't affected by, uh, let's say, a, a political vision of the contemporary subject as a cyborg that is dominated by a, a, data, a big data capitalism, which is like the information economical system of a social network structure that heterodirect the subject in a political perspective. So you gave accent to the multiplication of the self, so the selves as a process of individualism, individualization. So you gave, in a way, a positive accent to self as other. Uh, but in the same time, I feel the need, uh, and this I think you, uh, you started to uh, uh, discuss it at, at, at the end, I think I need the need to think about the strategy of how and ubiquitous identities are performed in everyday life as a subversive transformation of the, this contemporary data capitalism. Do you understand what I mean? Uh, <laughs> I, I was very smart, in my opinion, not to face the capitalism, the digital, digital capitalism contemporary transformation. And it was perhaps a, a kind of... Uh, methodological anatomy, no? that was separated, because uh, I, I think that uh, it should be very complex to, to think and rethink what is uh, uh, the new form of uh, 
uh, digital uh, capitalism and how is to connect to our uh, everyday experience. But in the same time, here I am a student of uh, Tatiana, uh, I think that there is a very possibili a possibility to, to, to live in, in the interstices, interstices, how do you say, interstices? In the interzones, in a way, eh? in this kind of convergence the kind of zones. Of, uh, yeah. In between uh, this dominant uh, capitalism uh, power and the way we can uh, imagine and experience in our uh, everyday life, uh, the second part of your question, our uh, ubiquitous identity. I think that uh, a, a political perspective, a contemporary political perspective, have to connect to ubiquitous identity. It's just our political uh, statement. It's not possible, I think, to work on politics not only in party, but in politics, uh, without uh, facing what it means, uh, ubiquitous uh, identity, contemporary ubiquitous identity. Because there is a great challenge, a great di diasporic challenge, not only in, in different culture, different experience, also different Berliners uh, people, or also Roma different people. We are in, in a continuous uh, uh, multiverted uh, contact uh, and we are not unified. We are not uh, homologated. I think that the homologation was a perspective on traditional mass media. But digital culture has a new kind of perspective. Here we can face a new kind of uh, subjectivity, for me, uh, multi-individuality, and how to express uh, our multi-individuality in our everyday life. Uh, well, this is, I suggest that this will be a, a new kind of seminary that Tatiana may organize, <laughs> because I think there is no possibility to fit. But this is just the core of our discussion. That is the core of, of every single person here in our room have to face his or her ubiquitous identity. And another question I want to tell you, uh, I want to ask you. Um, the, uh, one of the last book of Michel Elbeck that I, wrote, that I read, it's a French writer, that was called uh, the, the, the Map and the Territory, I don't know in English, La Carta del Territorio. At the end, he was saying that uh, the body now became a device for the information transi transition as economical plus value. And in a way, to be subversive today, um, uh, we can apply a strategy of subtraction from the information system. So do you think that subtraction can be uh, a micro-political strategy within uh, the construction of the cyborg as methodology? Well, I, 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 no, I, I, don't, I don't agree with this kind of uh, conclusion. Um, first of all, in the first uh, part of, of your quotation, this is a general, uh, more or like less general um, uh, thought that uh, we are going to grow the plus value of digital capitalism through our uh, everyday uh, digital operation. Well, this is a totalizing uh, system of, uh, of, per of, of, uh, of thinking. I, I think that everything is more complex. There is a polyphonic uh, and dissonant way also in this kind of uh, production. This kind of, I think, is a common sense, the Hulibeck uh, perspective. The common sense that is going to, uh, in, a, in a very special, uh, I, I don't agree with what I say, a, a middle class, uh, uh, um, urban uh, heterosexual <laughs> person that's going to agree with him, but I'm, I don't. And uh, yes, we are all, our bodies crossing um, 
digital communication, but we can invent a new kind of dissonant communication, just like uh, in, in the first image that I was showing to you uh, in Madrid, the no, in 3, 3D manifestation, it's possible to elaborate a new kind of uh, conflict, uh, not only a black block uh, explosion in the street and the day after it's okay everybody want to but this kind of uh, new kind of uh, political um, using of uh, the digital communication i think that uh, may uh, develop uh, uh, a new kind of of politics a communicational politics we have to explore the possibility of uh, communicational politics uh, and i think that uh, uh, Huli Beck uh, book, I didn't read it, I, I, I don't think that I will read, but I have a prejudice, a strong prejudice. Uh, but I think it is going to reconfirm a racist European pre pre prejudice against the different. But in this way, you are entering the an ideological perspective. An ideological perspective. You, you are taking an ideological point of view. While for me, uh, a, a, the strategy of a, an ubiquitous identity means even to embrace his dialectics. So if you would be a, ubiqu a ubiquitous identity, you should embrace Helbeck. I prefer to embrace the Cronenberg uh, consumed. <laughs> yeah, it's too easy. <laughs> Do I, does anybody of you have a question to make him? Please. Uh, that's too easy too, huh? Hello, it's working out. Okay. My question is easy. Too easy for you, I said. My question is easy. No, 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 I mean, no, I know, I'm not saying your question is easy. Uh, you're having a relationship with him, so the dialogue and communication, ah, I see. Okay. it's uh, easier, let's say. Well, normally ma marriage is not easy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I don't have a question, I have an uh, observation. I really like the end of your presentation uh, for one reason that connects to... Francesco question, which is um, how can we approach things in capitalism? I was wondering if um, when Massimo wasn't finding, he wasn't finding what he did, he wasn't finding the image that he chose, uh, and then it was a casino, it was, everything was like the PowerPoint was opened, and then you came and you were helping, and then there was like many popped up uh, uh, technology that he wasn't, he hadn't choose. And then immediately, we, let's say, the, the, one who, the ones who are organizing this, put the flyer back, the official yes. flyer back. Yes, the cyborg. It, yeah, let's say, so my observation is that how, how can we stand the uncontrolled, technological, unchosen, and um, not, made, not made for? So let's say there, there was a cognition. There was like a semiotics and a, let's say codes that it wasn't mean to be. And maybe this atimo, this moment of not meant to be, is the, the autonomy of the things. And maybe I would like to be able to look more, uh, more than the very beautiful uh, official flyer of the event. So my, 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 my thought is that maybe the traces should, could tell us more. That's my observation. Yeah, there was um, this reflection about white noise ethnography, this silent ethnography that comes out 
from the periphery of the methodolo methodological narrative uh, as uh, a meta vision of the narrative itself. So being able to use the noises as methodology. And in a way, it's an ubiquitous identity too, because it's a multiplication of perspective on a possible object that uses the uncontrolled that becomes uncanny. This is how I read it. Yes, I, I think that I agree what, with you and with Francesco. This is a kind of uh, methodology you have to experience on your research, how to be totally inside the, the a funeral, a baroro funeral, a very dramatic emotional funeral, uh, the most important uh, event of my ethnographic experience, and in the same time, how to take a picture, how to be far, how to be distant, how to be totally inside the outside. This is a kind of methodology that is not possible to teach. Yes, I can tell you, but first of all, I think that the experience will be on the field work. So if you want to come with me in Baroro culture, you can experiment this kind of uh, complex uh, uh, methodology, both rational, emotional, filming, dancing, and crying, and crying methodology. Do you have any questions? Here's a question. I'd like to thank for the talk and the presentation. It was very interesting. And uh, it's a shame, I don't know if maybe now you might have the time to go through the colonial matrix of this construction. Because I found it, uh, in, it's, there was no chance for the presentation to talk about it. And I kind of related the practice of ethnography and the very nature of the practice, uh, the discipline, in together with the term heteronomia and how to transcend identity and how can the ethnographer get into the picture of the research? I think that uh, post-colonial studies uh, still have a great limit that is uh, that uh, post-colonial didn't study the ethnic culture, native, so-called native culture, but was uh, a, a research about uh, this kind of state that were under colonial power. But in uh, native culture, it's totally different. So Post-colonial studies has this limit, just the line of an aldea, on a village. And so, uh, uh, I can tell you uh, that I, I, I totally know that it, it's not impossible in a few words, but uh, uh, there was a, a very special moment in, in my experience, uh, both ethnographic and uh, multivisual, that uh, the great friend of mine, Baroro friend of mine, the master of songs, Mestre dos Cantos, he, he knows the, 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 the Baroro songs are a very special, uh, monumental culture, very complex, uh, many, many forms of, uh, of singing, of dancing, of playing. And uh, Jose Carlos Cuguri was the last one in the Aldeia, in the Meruri Aldeia. And uh, when he died, uh, there was a very special funeral. Obviously, I was invited there. And there was a moment, uh, Sheila was with me, a, a moment where the Jose Carlos skull was transformed in this ancestral being, another kind of heteronomy, heteronomia. And uh, I didn't imagine that I was invited to, to cross a line, to go inside a very special circle 
where I was just near every bones of Jose Carlos. I was just there with a the smile, with the weeping, the crying of other two, but just we were in three persons inside this circle. And uh, after that, I embraced the Jose Carlos cup. How it was possible? I was crying, obviously. It was a, a very emotional. I, 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 there's no time to tell you all the, the story, the relationship between Jose Carlos and me. But in that very special moment, uh, I, I, I didn't control any moment of my body. I was crying. But in the very same time, I think that I was crying. I was totally emotionally involved in this uh, unique uh, ritual. In the same time, in the same ubiquitous time, I was looking at me and at him. Because this is ethnography and this is friendship. And I think that this is even uh, pain, so it's even emotional. So you use the emotions to multiply your point of view, which is uh, a new ethnographical methodology that is called self-ethnography. And okay. what? Okay. Yeah. To me, for example, self-ethnography can be a strategy to apply the idea of ubiquitous identity as a, a political strategy, in a way. And this ubiquity identity is crossing our digital culture, but also a borrowed funeral. This is my problem. The skull was a ubiquity identity. That's my question. So, do you have any other questions? Please. Here, there, there. Yeah. I just wanted to, I mean, in the continuity from the, this, question, this question about uh, postcolonial, I'm just thinking that this uh, ubiquitous identity is in this uh, context from, of colonial perspectives is also how and who is represented by who. And maybe this was the di direction of this question. And maybe it's also problematic that you as a white, peop white man, obviously. Uh, She's saying that, sorry if I uh, allow myself to... Uh, to, uh, to say what I think, yeah, yeah it's very nice. <laughs> so you are addressing the question, the missed question of him. I'm, I'm just uh, going on this perspective because I think your question... Yeah, uh, sorry, go on and then uh, we, we... Yeah, will. I'm just thinking that this, this question of identity is also a question of representation. And who is of? Representation, representation and who is representing who yes. in, in terms of images, in terms of uh, ethnography and, yeah, okay. and a big, uh, also a big uh, colonial tradition. The question of who represents who um, is uh, um, the, the central result of my research on Bororo culture. Because I was, uh, in, in, uh, just at the beginning, I was uh, making a distinction between auto representation and hetero representation. Uh, there, there were uh, four Bororo friends of mine, an equipe of Bororo women, uh, men and one woman. Um, based on, the, on uh, self representation, and I thought that my my role was ethno representation. But uh, during the research, I understood that it was not possible that I was in the same time be, uh, uh, expressing and uh, self my self representation. So um, and. Uh, also because the, the power of who represents who is the power of anthropology, the traditional power of anthropology, not only in the so-called native culture, 
but also in the sociology of contemporary culture. So I think that, in my opinion, digital technology, digital culture have this kind of special possibility to destroy the power of the unique form of interpretation, it, the sociologists, the anthropologists, the psychologists, the journalists, and so on, the artists, and so on. So now we, are, we have a very special moment, political moment, but also artistic, uh, literary, and so on, moment based on self-representation and the crisis of a traditional way of representation that was, and still is, a very powerful system, a very powerful system. So self-representation, how to re-elaborate, re-enact self-representation uh, using digital culture and uh, ubiquitous identity. This is my, my focus and my research, both in Bororo culture and in, in urban culture and digital culture. Uh, Bororo, metro, uh, urban and uh, net digital culture are three kinds of the system that are interlaced. Okay, so uh, time uh, is over. <laughs> and uh, I, I want to close this session uh, by uh, quoting uh, the Temple of Psychic Youth, that in one of uh, their message um, promoted the idea to abolish, to abolish um, and eradicate the pronoun I, and invited people to represent themselves as we. So, uh, from that moment on, if you want to perform a ubiquitous identity, you have to present yourself as we, okay? <laughs> and uh, so, I, uh, I thank you all. I thank the, um, the, um, the Batanian and uh, the, the Disruption Lab to give us uh, the possibility to dialogue after such a long time, because we are not doing anything together since like 20 years, yeah? And uh, we invite you uh, to follow and slide uh, into the <coughs> cyber feminist perspective that will go on uh, uh, later tomorrow. And uh, stay with us, uh, and I invite you, Tatiana, to close the session. Thank you. Thank you.